So what I wanted to discuss is um, the negative as such, or what I'm looking for is the negative. And there is already this trend in philosophy, in psychology, in psychoanalysis to kind of resist positivity and to embrace or to side with, with negativity. So to, and not only in, in, in philosophy and psychology, even in the common, uh, in just in society is a conventional thing right now to criticize what is called toxic positivity to expose this toxicity, toxic side of the positive and to kind of embrace the voice of sadness and this despair and loss. But um, it all kind of fails all the endeavors in all the dimensions, including common dimension, the dimension of philosophy and of psychology, it doesn't work. This attempt to embrace the negative, attempt to, to accept the negative, because whoever kind of tries to embrace it, they betray. It. There is no, maybe there is no way to, to do so, no matter how hard we try. And the simple example would be uh, like the, the common uh, attempt now is to call to embrace the negative feelings uh, like loss, despair mourning in order to live it through, in order to be relieved, to be freed from them. So it's always this, but why this, what is the positive side of doing this negative thing? There's also always, always something in exchange. There is always something positive in exchange to embrace the negativity and it's not embrace. If it's for elevating, uh, meliorating suffering, it's not actually embracing suffering. So, and in philosophy too, starting with uh, whoever, starting with Kierkegaard, the most depressive, desperate philosopher, who claims that there is nothing in us except for despair, that human condition is such is this desperate state that we are in the negation of ourselves, whether we are recognizing it, we are in despair or we don't recognize it. So the only thing we can work on is our despair because this is who we are, this kind of negative self. But what Kierkegaard offers in exchange is this paradoxical leap of faith. Like at the end, you paradoxically still get the most positive thing, the unity with God, the most affirmative um, phenomena. And similarly with Heidegger, even though you don't get God, but if you embrace this anxiety or angst to which human condition we are kind of doomed, to feel this anxiety and to get in touch into being you in exchange you get uh, authentic uh, way of existence way of being so you you're still good you're still getting something when you accept this angst or anxiety and for hegel the one who thinks about negativity for whom this negativity play a primal kind of is a primal moving force he still and he was criticized many many times for it he still kind of it's the work of the negative, but it still uh, comes to the greater affirmation. Like something is even bigger this, than what was negated is affirmed. And in critical theory, Adorno, who talks, who tries to save this negativity from positivity in, in Hegel, and who claims to establish the negative dialectics, he also has the problem with critical theories, even though they recognize suffering something important as something and like happiness is more uh not as stupid but it's not it clo it um covers the truth and but still the the end goal for them for critical theorists and for this uh, negative dialectics is to establish so uh, society that is suffering less there is more united with less conflicts it's still in exchange of something positive. And in psychoanalysis, my favorite concept of death drive that Freud uh, discovers, not discovers, but accepts from Sabina Spielrein, um, it's still, even though it recognizes that human being is essentially death driven, not life driven, like you saw before, there is something in us that is sabotaging itself. So we are kind of the self-sabotaging mechanism that is driven towards its own death. But um, the very fact he kind of steps away, steps back from it, um, 
and because psychoanalysis implies that it's also practice, there is something practical, therapeutic aspect to it. And the, in, in all, like the truth of the death drive, if you accept it fully, it means that psychoanalysis as therapy doesn't work because what Freud call, called a negative therapeutic reaction when person, because of this death drive thing, uh, sabotages what is uh, like what the, the program of betterment of psychoanalysts. Uh, they don't let to be, even though or if they uh, demand, they like to be improved and to get less suffering, uh, to ameliorate suffering they kind of sabotage it. And uh, there is this recognized phenomena of negative therapeutic reaction, but it's still, whatever it is recognized, it's still kind of uh, within the context, it put in, it, it is normally found in the context how to overcome this negative therapeutic reaction. But there is no, if death drive is central, there is no outside of the negative therapeutic reaction, just human being is someone who is incurable. It's impossible to. Uh, cure it. It's impossible even to help in, and it's questionable what help is. So the psychoanalysis, like it's a break of psychoanalysis, the, the centrality of the death drive. We shouldn't, if we fully recognize it, we, the psychoanalysis, the therapeutic practice wouldn't, practice wouldn't even exist. So, and because uh, there is this practical side to it, psychoanalysis is in a, unable to uh, kind of fully integrate its own uh, this kind of negative insight. And it's not only in psychoanalysis, it's everywhere. In psychology, and this negative trend, uh, the one I like a lot of depressive realism, uh, it's when depression is not recognized like in conventional psychology as a disorder or deviation, but as more realistic perception of reality. Uh, it's still too positive. It still implies this realism, implies that you're more realistic in your perception. It gives you something, <laughs> it gives you a better grasp of, of reality. But, and even uh, philosophical pessimism and uh, even anti antinatalism, like the worst pessimistic ones, they're also positive uh, because antinatalism and my favorite philosopher, Peter Wessel Zapfe, who was antinatalist and uh, philosophical pessimist, they also offer even though they claim that we have to kind of stop existing, stop reproducing at least uh, as a first step, they still see it as a, because we are a mistake of nature, we doomed to suffer and suffering is our uh, deepest, the heart of us, of our existence. And it's still claiming that we have to stop existing the way Tzapka does it. He still suggests that it is in order to stop the suffering and it's still a way out. Just we need to die, so we won't we won't suffer. It's still very very positive um, uh, thing that they give in exchange, and because of that, because of this positive extra that they give, the way they try to accept negativity and they fail with this adding positivity to it, they occupy the place of the position of Messiah, like the one who is guiding somewhere, the one who is saving someone, and it's not. Uh, it's not a very good position. So I'm the one who is reducing uh, suffering. So I was wondering if um, if actually negatively oriented thinking, negative thinking is possible. And maybe it's not only philosophy, psychology, religion, and um, those structures failing to embrace negativity. Maybe it's thinking as such and language as such are positively oriented and they just reject the negativity. Even if they accept it, um, they need to add something positive. It's how language works, how um, how thinking works. In the simple example, if you say that uh, life is suffering and we're all going to die, <laughs> like you can't say it. You, you wait that you'll say, but, or you would, would you just add but to it and transform it into something positive. You can't recognize it. You always, like thinking works in this positive, uh, positive way. So it might be that it's impossible to actually stand with the with the negative. And if you try to, uh, if you just go and 
say <laughs> we're all going to die and life is suffering without any but you will this will be this will seem as something incomplete like there there's supposed to be some, something that compensate what you just said or it will provoke resistance or confusion or denial like Freud's concept of a death drive, which it's very hard to accept. Even Freud uh, was struggling to accept his own uh, concept. Or you will be considered sick, you know, especially if you don't have PhD or something like that. And CBT will diagnose you with this depressogenic thinking. It'll try to improve you, make you more positive, more in touch with, with reality. So, um, and especially if it's not only theory, especially if it's there is practice to it, like philosophical practice, some kind of counseling, and you just claim it, you will be considered uh, either charlatan or fraud. But the the counselor who doesn't uh, therapist or person that practices, uh, if they don't offer improvement or if they don't offer of life or amelioration of suffering, it's, it doesn't make sense. It, it won't be accepted. So it's kind no. of impossible to accept it but just the, because of the, how thinking works and because how, um, how language works. And Adorno claimed that um, maybe to think this negative dialectics, we need to think kind of uh, against thought that he's, uh, impression expression but he actually failed uh, i think in <laughs> doing that in thinking against the sort and thinking not not uh, leaning towards where it's thinking just naturally goes but um so it's the, it, the something that i want to do is probably impossible thing to do and maybe uh Maybe it is possible in a way, but or to a certain extent, uh, just not covering it with, with positivity, but maybe you have to be broken inside enough or disillusioned enough, not to run away enough, and maybe even stop talking. Maybe it's not about language. And the other question is not only thinking negatively, but uh, is negative practice possible? Like what would we do with each other if we're not, uh, aiming to improve each other life or help each other or improve the other or like something is there any practice to it because practice is poss possibly also exclusively uh, kind of uh, positively oriented justifies itself as uh, with a positive aim even if we're hurting each other it still has the very positive aim so I mean consciously uh, hurting um so and but on the other hand if we follow some psychoanalytic thinking uh, negativity is not something we need to um, to guard to protect because it's always there it's always it's always already constitutive to us to who we are to our identity which is at the same time this non-identity negation of itself to our relationship with others, that is the practice of what we do. At the core, it is already negative. It's just that we cover it um, to pretend that we are very rational and positively oriented. We cover it with something positive, just you're not allowed to uh, not to cover it, to expose it. Even though when we expose it, it feels like the most genuine and the most like the truth of, of relationship. For example, it is already there in when we try to help each other. And I think that help is very questionable. It's impossible, it's illusion. It's impossible to help. It just doesn't make sense. It's something, the phenomena that is holding on to the double illusion, the illusion that someone is helping and the kind of fantasy or illusion of the one who is helped that they were helped, that it helped them. Kind of need to take care of someone uh, we pretend that we help and the other person pretend that it helps and this is how it works and pretend that it helps um, it's actually also taking care of the one who is helping but where is this like the point of you were we was helped you you're going to die <laughs> there is no you're unhelpable and the moment uh, i think that the moment when we recognize once we 
close enough or desperate enough that we can recognize the person who is who wants to help uh, recognizes that no matter what they do, they are not able to help, they like give up. And the person who is helped recognized that uh, he is unhelpable, she is unhelpful, no matter any help. And this is the moment of like revealing this nothingness, the impossibility, unhelpfulness, and impossibility to help. And this is where we actually feel this genuine negative core of what unites us. But in normal life, uh, normally we have to kind of cover this uh, negativity. So it's all at the same time already there, but um, it's kind of hard to keep it within a language or uh, within the practice, not to escape from it. Maybe because one would actually um, stop existing if you genuinely accept the negative, at least stop talking and interacting with others. And there is interesting, the last thing that the, inter the interesting practic practice that I found that is maybe closer, the closest one to the negative practice is the this tradition um, in different cultures of, so there is this thing as keening in Ireland. Uh, there is such thing as uh, holosinia in Ukrainian, it's called in Prichitania in Russian. So it's practice of vocal lament, normally performed by women, when they just uh, lamenting, recognizing kind of the tragedy of existence and sharing suffering, and not with a not with a cause to uh, ameliorate it. It's actually not it just not to let not let to let suffering go. It just for no reason, but it's also because of this. Probably, well, it's obviously tragic moment the recognition of a tragedy but because it's meaninglessness it's also kind of has this comic side to it right it's um and it was used from this comical uh side in, in many times i mean it's it's also funny so maybe it's it's not only language there are different types of uh vocalization and uh, practice with each other that um that can kind of stand be there with the negative uh, maybe some kind of practice that still that has language but it's not the main element to it so uh, that's all if you have questions i'm ready to answer so what is what is the aim of negative psychoanalysis? I mean, what's the positive side of the negative? <laughs> yeah, that's the question that has no answer. There is no aim. I can say that the or oh, there is the paradoxical aim of embracing this negativity, um, which, uh, in a way rejects all aims like it's there is no goal to it because if we see the goal or if we see normally goal is positively oriented it's kind of improvement or restoring justice or it's this space without the aim. or maybe aim that defeats itself that doesn't work that is um that is doomed to failure like any thing <laughs> He's yeah, I, mean, I, I see what you're what you what you're saying, but it seems to me like as if you are offering something with negative psychoanalysis, yeah, or if you want, you. psychoanalysis destroys itself. I mean, that's a death drive. But mm. I'm, I'm but, but I mean, I actually agree with most of the things you say in any way. But I just I can't. Uh, yeah, I just. Oh, oh, it's baffling me, uh, not not with its aim because it's kind of aimless, but just its function. I also think that it's not only negative psychoanalysis that doesn't have aim and doesn't have uh, function, doesn't have um, improvement to it or something like. It, there is no way to justify it, right? It's also life and it's also love, like some all the human stuff. 
uh, that we like is also aimless if there is um, there is a way to justify why we're supposed to live like if there is meaning to life and if there is meaning not meaning but uh, if we can justify love with something it's not love I mean it's it's supposed to be meaningless it's not supposed to have goal to it if it has a goal we feel that it's kind of not what we uh, not what we talk about when we talk about pure law something like that so the pure phenomena like life uh, they also we can say well negative but also kind of from this perspective death driven uh, meaningless and self-sabotaging okay <laughs> i'm struggling with this i mean i agree with all the stuff about you know the, the that we're all kind of walking dead, uh, but, uh, and I understand what you're saying about it, it, every form of so-called therapy is just trying to uh, escape that fact uh, and get you happy. But I'm still, I'm still struggling with the negative, psych negative psychoanalysis. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. But it's almost like the A, well, there isn't a name, the aim, the, the aim of the, with all the non-aim of, of, of negative psychoanalysis seems to be a, some kind of mystical nothingness. Yeah. <laughs> I, but, but, I, even, but even that is something. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, I really liked you when you were talking about the impossibility of this really because i think that that's the point but what what i think is helpful for my thinking and what you're saying is that it wherever you kind of get to it becomes undermined your position in some way starts to fall away so the the reason i would resonate strongly with a lot of what you just said is because it it allows um it allows something to keep moving in a way, which again is something. There is something that I am taking from, from what it is you're saying. It keeps like the, the kind of space alive um, to actually make a mockery of almost everything that you're saying. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think that that's really impo important. You know, it's, it, that really serves a useful purpose if what people might do, certainly myself, is get kind of stuck in an idea or a way of thinking that I've worked things out or whatever it might be. If I think about negativity in the way that you presented it, it, it just wipes it away. And then I then I go again and then that's wiped away. And I really enjoy that. <laughs> that's a death drive, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> so yeah, the the um for freud uh, life is kind of the tour of death so it's the glitch within the death deviation from itself that produces something like life or um or movement but it still wasn't so he just switched the perspective with this death drive with the centrality of death whether um life is not opposite to death or like it's normally so the death uh, life yeah, death takes life away. Like there's this larger scope of life within which death works, but it never conquers life. So Freud just switched perspective. Death is central and life is something happening within the death as its own deviation. It's still it's still death. We are still dying. Just we are dying. Uh, this is a process of dying life. It was so that just the switch of, of this perspective. And psychoanalysis in itself uh, is negative not it's not that i'm uh, i think it's not that i'm inventing something but only if it's uh, recognizes what it already recognizes the centrality of a death drive uh, that freud postulates and kind of steps away from it if you actually accept it the it's the break it, the breakage breakdown of psychoanalysis and the way it function after it it's the like it's it's denial of psychoanalysis within psychoanalysis, which is its own death, and it is the living death. It's like the mm, 
it's the tour of its death. And that's why I like psychoanalysis the most out of all the uh, practicing. It um, On the surface, it looks like normal therapy. It manages to pretend that it's functioning as something that improves in life and competing with other therapists who will improve other life or comprehend a human being better. But on in the in the heart of it, in its inner heart, it's this it's impossible thing and existence impossible and something that's not supposed to exist anymore. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Do you do you think um, if if you, if we were to perform a similar experiment with positive psychoanalysis, that we would eventually find or just find that it's impossible to do? In yeah, the sense that the negative... terrible, terrible question, but really good one. <laughs> because if you go deeper, I think than what I just said was this distinction on positive psychology, negative psychoanalysis. I think that positive psychology and this positive orientation, this happy society, even toxic positivity. Uh, so everything that I mentioned goes against negative psychoanalysis or this negative uh, acceptance of the negative. It's even more desperate. Like it's <laughs> because it's so desperate, it tries to run away from it so pathetically, like with the all the life uh, affirming. Uh, which is comic too, <laughs> like it's not because because they know that uh, it kind of sucks. Uh, the the deeper you know, the deeper the more you're desperate to affirm it, to bring it back to. Um, and it's terrifying. It's comic and terrifying at the same time. It's trying like acting, and it's crazy. It's like acting that someone who died is still alive, like not recognized, and because of the despair. So there is even more despair to it than in in a way. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> just don't tell positive psychologists that. <laughs> I can't believe, I mean, I'm not, this is a criticism, but I can't believe that most psychoanalysts are thinking that what they're doing is utterly pointless. I mean, if, he, if that's what you, or, or they know that what they're doing is utterly pointless, but they're still doing it anyway. Yeah, there was the, this book, I think I mentioned on depressive realism, I forgot who wrote it again, but uh, he mentioned something that uh, women, it's actually more like male phenomena being realistic and depressed, and uh, women are less like more prone to depression, something like that, more cheerful. And he said that it's maybe because they have children and they can't um, can't be all depressed. They're supposed to be <laughs> like after they, they left. But it's on the contrary, I think, because the there's this tragedy is um, because they know more, especially when they have children. Like they give birth to something that is doomed to suffer and to die at the end. It doesn't make sense and. Um, I mean, it's precisely be and precisely because you know uh, the tragedy and the, there is no way out, how there is no way out to it. You, to compensate, you try to be. Uh, the way people treat women, especially children, like was, was all the uh, kind of pathetic. To, like it's because they know, because they experience it more, maybe. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I I don't think the majority of people are walking around. I think they're fully um, involved with 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 the escape. I, I don't I don't think well maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that most people ever kind of well maybe they do get near to just complete um, desolation. No, I don't think most of the mums and dads I see wandering around, and most people are, are, aren't. I think they're fully involved in the, uh, in the game. Yeah, they're happy, you know, 
uh, and they want to be happier. Yeah, but it's according to Kierkegaard, we all despair. Just some of us recognize it and some of us don't. And it's better, according to him, to recognize it and to stop working with it. Yeah, I mean, I like I like Kierkegaard. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of religious, though, isn't it? I mean, he is giving it. Yeah, saying, that's his own despair, and that's the result. Sorry? That's the result of his ex escape, right? He he manages to recognize it, but he's still escaping it. Yeah, exactly. He's 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 escaping into God. Yep. Good a place to go as any, I guess. <laughs> Julie, what do you do? You have any ideas or thoughts then on? Well. Maybe I'll I'll say something different. Uh, for me, for me personally, and for a lot of people that I've met more clinically than probably anywhere else, um, the degree to which you suffer is going to be quite important. And if you can use some negativity, in a sense, to push yourself um as well as much into the suffering as you possibly can i guess a bit like kierkegaard's point that if you if you kind of have some understanding and realization around pain suffering loss or whatever it might make a life it might but it might not but it might make a life more livable or bearable do do you what's your do you have any connection to that or is that in any way not important either it's an interesting point because maybe even word suffering is not that good because it presupposes that uh again with the especially in um, psychotherapeutic framework it presupposes that uh, we work with suffering meaning we either trying to reduce it or we're trying to find meaning of how to suffer properly it's still like it's not what suffering, same with depression, what similar, uh, what they define, they're simultaneously trying to escape, like give meaning to suffering or uh, attain some meaning through suffering. And th this thing that uh, psychoanalytic idea that we enjoy more uh, what we suffer for, kind of there's a, this putting it in this dialectic with pleasure and meaning and, and, uh, amelioration or the joy it's it's not it's not what suffering is i mean uh, uh so it's impossible to uh, maybe suffering is a good word but it's not good in ways uh, what other words would be uh it would be used with and that's the language you you say something negative and then you immediately uh, slip into be from it somewhere. Otherwise, it just interrupt the, the interruption of the language. This comic, tragical lamenting. <laughs> Shall we stop and proceed to shame? <laughs> 